Morning, everyone. Great to see you here. <clears throat> We're continuing in our, uh, our journey through John's Gospel again today. We've, um, we started again this month with Chapter 5, and we uh, heard the description of how Jesus healed a man miraculously in Jerusalem, and then got into quite a discussion and quite a uh, challenging confrontation, really, with the Jewish leaders who, it records, actually were looking for ways to kill him. So great hostility there. But today we move to a different scene. We're in chapter 6 now, and as you saw on the, uh, the kids' video, uh, and we heard from the scriptures, that um, we're now in a quite different location. So John talks about how the, uh, Jesus and his disciples were now uh, up near the Sea of Galilee. So they've moved from Jerusalem right up to the north. <clears throat> and um, and he's moved from, they've moved from the busy city to a peaceful place in the countryside, uh, by the seaside. They've moved from the um, uh, opposition and hostility to a place where there's enthusiastic popularity for the Lord Jesus, as you've read. And... Uh, and whereas chapter 5 largely contains a lot of um, teaching and discussion by the Lord Jesus, today's passage is simply a description of an amazing, spectacular event. We read that there was a great crowd was following Jesus because they saw the signs that he'd performed in healing the sick. And uh, unlike a lot of the miracles that we read about with Jesus that benefited one particular person or maybe a few people, this is one that benefited a huge number of people uh, all at the same time. So it also means there were lots of witnesses to this miracle. And, uh, and you might even say it's a kind of a minor thing that he did for them. They weren't, uh, some of them were, were sick obviously, and, um, but they were people in good health, but they were just hungry. And, uh, Jesus provided for that physical need. But it's an amazingly uh, spectacular event. And you might even say, kind of hard to comprehend. How, how did this happen? And how did Jesus do it? And some people might even say, I just don't believe it. How could that happen? It's a very familiar story. Uh, anyone who's got any kind of um, knowledge of the Bible, uh, even the smallest amount, uh, knows about this event. Uh, we often call it the feeding of the 5,000. And if you say that to people, talk about the feeding of the 5,000, most people know exactly what you mean, won't they? Straight away. It's a famous event, it's a familiar event, but let's today just take a little bit of time to consider what John tells us about this event and what we can learn from it. And I kind of think, if you put yourself in the position of the people who were there, what they were thinking, what they were observing, how they reacted, the position of the disciples. They'd never seen anything like this before. They didn't expect it. Um, no one who was there had any clue, had any idea what Jesus was going to do except the Lord. He knew what he was going to do. So we read that this great crowd had followed Jesus into this remote place. It was a nice peaceful place, but fairly remote and uh, apparently scenic and restful. Probably the kind of place you might take your family for a, a picnic uh, on a nice spring day. Uh, near the water, lots of grass. And, uh, but these people weren't there for a picnic. They'd come to see Jesus. They'd come to listen to Jesus and they'd come to maybe even hope they saw some more of his miracles. Well, they certainly saw a miracle, but not the kind they were expecting. It's not a healing miracle, but a creation miracle. So we're reading here, we've been reading in John's account, but this, this uh, event is actually recorded in all of the Gospels. So Matthew, Mark and Luke also tell the story of this event. And uh, they all tell the story in slightly different ways and we get a little bit of detail here, a little bit of detail there and together they give us a fuller picture of what happened. 
But it's also interesting that should confirm our understanding of how precious the Gospels are, that um, they confirm each other, but they're different. So they give us different insights. Now, they all said, each of the Gospel writers mentioned the large crowd that had followed Jesus, and uh, they were so keen that they followed him all the way to the other side of the lake. Jesus and his disciples, we read in another part, that they travelled by boat across the lake, but the people just wanted, were so keen, they just kept running all the way around the lake um, so that they could see Jesus and see what he was going to do next. And we actually read in the other Gospels, John doesn't mention it, but um, the other Gospel writers mention that Jesus' plan here was to take the disciples aside to a quiet, nice, quiet place. They could have a bit of respite, a bit of um, downtime. But then this crowd of people turned up. But importantly, the uh, Gospel writers also record that when Jesus saw the large crowd, large crowd he had compassion on them. Um, Mark says that he welcomed them, sorry, Luke says that he welcomed them. Mark says that Jesus saw them as sheep without a shepherd. And uh, Mark tells us that he began teaching them many things. And uh, Luke and Matthew tell us that he healed those who needed healing on that day. Now, John doesn't mention those details, but, uh, but we do read here the words of Jesus to Philip. When he saw the crowd coming, and uh, you remember there, and it's in verse 5, if you've got the Bible open there, um, when Jesus saw the great crowd coming, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Now, Philip must have been a fairly practical-minded man, and uh, we see there that he responded with uh, sort of saying, well, he was basically saying, well, that's impossible. <laughs> um, he, uh, he, it's as if he's kind of saying, well, what kind of question is that, Lord? Like, um, even, if, um, even if there was somewhere to go and buy enough food for these people, where would we get the money? Um, we don't have all the money that it takes and that the, uh, the, the reading we said, it, it said he would take, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for these people to eat. So the explanation for that is in, in the original translation, it actually says that um, he said 200 denarii worth of bread uh, would not be enough for each of them just to have a bite. And um, a, denari a denarius was what a person might get for one day's wages. So 200 days' wages, he's saying. So that's why the NIV tells us it's more, more than six months of wages. And uh, so Philip's kind of saying, well, if we had $50,000 in the kitty, we wouldn't even have enough to go and buy everyone a snack. Kind of an impossible question. And the other gospel writers tell us that it was actually the disciples who came to Jesus and they said, and this is what Mark says, this is a remote place and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and the villages and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus then said, and this is how Matthew records it, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Boy, it's getting even harder, isn't it? And then we, and uh, Mark says that Philip's response was, um, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? But Jesus does, of course, unexpected things here. In Mark's account, Jesus says, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And all the four gospel writers say the same thing, they came back and said, we've only got five loaves and two fish. We, we read in John's re record that uh, it was actually Andrew who came along and he'd found a boy who had these five little buns, loaves of small loaves and two fish. But what is that among so many? And you wonder what the other disciples were thinking, looking at Andrew, thinking, we've got to feed all these people and you bring five loaves and two fish. So can you imagine 
what the disciples are thinking. But the Lord Jesus takes charge. Just in a few words we read, because he's the only one who knows what's going to happen. Have the people sit down. And it says there was plenty of grass, there was plenty of space, so everyone could sit down. And uh, can you imagine what's in the minds of the people? All these thousands of people are there and uh, they're gathered around thinking, what's, what's going on? And uh, uh, by the way, it's probably good to just get an idea in your head, isn't it, of what 5,000 people might look like. I don't know if you've been in a crowd that big somewhere, maybe in a big uh, theatre or a big place in the city or something like that. Um, one way I was looking at it was if, if you filled this, all our seats here, we'd probably have about 150 people. Okay? So if everyone went out and then we brought more in and we refilled the building maybe seven times, um, we'd have about a 1,000. Oh, so if you did that five times, we fill up the building here 35 times, we've got around 5,000 now. And that's not counting the women and the children. So let's just understand how many people were here and yet how orderly this was that uh, after everyone sit down and they did. And then we see this remarkable act of the Lord Jesus. Just in a sentence or two, verse 11, Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. By the way, people who know about the culture of that time say they were probably either dried fish or maybe pickled fish that you were carrying around you know, in your satchel in the countryside. And the other accounts tell us that Jesus actually gave the, the, the pieces and the, to the disciples and the disciples distributed them. So again, just try and get this picture of all these thousands of people sitting on the grass and the disciples coming and going. First of all, they stand and watch the Lord Jesus. Can you imagine um, what would be that uh, he's... He takes one loaf and he breaks it into pieces, maybe puts it in a basket. He breaks another one, puts it in a basket and it's taken away. And you can imagine they go away and empty those baskets. They come back and get some more baskets. It's hard to visualise, isn't it, exactly how this would have happened. Do you believe the Lord Jesus could do this? It's just such a remarkable thing to recount, isn't it? Can you imagine being there and uh, seeing what was happening? And yet, as they distributed it, came back, got more, kept going, everyone had enough. Everyone had more than enough. Mark says they all ate and were satisfied. Do you believe the Lord Jesus could do this? Impossible, isn't it? Look, I couldn't do it, you couldn't do it. But who is Jesus? The one who created the universe. We read back in the beginning of John's Gospel that where John calls him the Word, the Word who was in the beginning, he was with God and he was God. Through him all things were made. He is the creator. What an astounding thing it would have been to have been there. And remember John's words near the end of um, his Gospel in, you go over to chapter 20 and verse 30. It says, Jesus, and this is what John says, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And, of course, we have the extra little... Note at the end of this recount, and it's mentioned by all the, the gospel writers, Jesus said, go and collect the leftovers, and they fill up 12 baskets full of leftovers. There was food in abundance. Everyone had been well fed. So how should we react to what we've been reading, thinking about? We read how the people who were there reacted when they saw this amazing miracle. 
Verse 14, we read, After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. And they were referring to that Old Testament prophecy that was read at the beginning of the service from Deuteronomy, when Moses had been speaking to the people of Israel and said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, from among your brothers, you must listen to him. So these people were saying, oh, he's the prophet. Imagine what they'd seen. This is the special person. This is the promised Messiah. So they were rightly recognising that Jesus had come from God, that Jesus had authority, that Jesus had amazing power. All of this they could recognise. But then it goes on to say they had a wrong idea. And maybe we would have got the wrong idea too. They had a wrong idea that, um, of what kind of king Jesus would be. We read in verse 15 that the people intended to come and make him king by force. Presumably thinking he would be the kind of person who could lead the nation to overthrow the foreign invaders the foreign rulers that they had. And, of course, we, in hindsight, from our viewpoint, knowing more, uh, know that that's not the kind of king that Jesus came to be. Uh, That was not Jesus' intention. It was not the Father's plan for him. And uh, later on, if you go to chapter 18 in John, you can read where Jesus was standing before Pilate when he'd been arrested And he said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. And then we read that Jesus, knowing their intention, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So Jesus was very popular. People wanted to to submit to him and um, see him as their king. But sadly, when you read on in this chapter further on, not too much further down, we read that lots of the people who'd been following him and listening to him stopped following him. uh, uh, Down in verse 66 of the chapter, we read, um, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. So we'll discover that over the next few weeks as we, um, we look further into this chapter. So we've seen that many had followed in their thousands and yet the time came when many turned back and no longer followed him. You'll also see, though, importantly, when you read further in the chapter, I encourage you to do it when you've got time at home. Keep reading on in uh, chapter 6, ready for our next few weeks together, that um, Jesus takes up this theme of food and eating to teach things that are very important. And uh, in verse 26 we read, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs that I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. In other words, they saw the signs but didn't understand them, um, the full implication of them. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Now, it's still true in our day that many people might be attracted to Jesus. They might want to know more about him. They might want to listen to his teaching. They might even be impressed by him and realise that he's someone special, but who might ultimately turn back and lose their interest in following him. We read when we were in chapter 5 where the Lord said, gave an amazing promise. I tell you the truth, chapter 5, verse 24, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He or she has crossed over from death to life. So whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me. So we understand, of course, it's not just meaning hearing physically and even showing some interest. It's hearing and believing. Believing 
with the God-given faith, that means you entrust yourself to him. To be rescued from God's righteous wrath, to be forgiven of your sins, to have new life in Christ and assurance of an eternal inheritance beyond this life, all by God's mercy and God's grace. I just remind you again of what John said was his purpose. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. If you are one who has heard and believed, rejoice in that, that God has enabled you to be translated from death to life. But if you're not yet that person, don't be like those who came and wanted to hear Jesus, wanted to see more, and even recognised that he was someone special, but then later turned back and no longer followed him. So whether you're young or old, whether you've known things about Jesus for a short time or a long time, whether you've even started to recognise that he's someone special or whether you're still undecided about that, don't turn away, don't turn back. Persevere in your thinking, in your inquiries, keep on listening and learning, try to understand more fully and I hope and trust that you will realise by God's grace that he can be your saviour, your rescuer, to bring you from death to life, from being rightfully condemned to being God's child, blessed with eternal life in Christ.